Welcome to Poetry London's first event of the fall season. I'm Jennifer Quinton from London Public Library and I will be your host for this evening. First of all, we would like to acknowledge that we are in the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewek, Huron-Wendat, and neutral Trinantan peoples. The First Nations communities of our local area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. Poetry London values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island or North America. We also acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices in, that Indigenous peoples endure in Canada and the importance of directly addressing these injustices in daily life. Poetry London would like to thank our generous event sponsors, including the London Arts Council, the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, the League of Canadian Poets, Digibee.net, Gordon Hill Press, and DC Books. Please note that the most recent books by our September feature readers are available for purchase through the links in the video description below. More than ever, Poetry London believes in the importance of supporting small press publishers and your local independent bookstores. Before the reading begins, here is info about an upcoming local arts event. On Wednesday, October 7th at 6.30 p.m., Lomp Reading Series will feature poet Dominic Prezien in collaboration with musician, writer Forrest Muran. The event will premiere on the Facebook page of TAP, Centre for Creativity, and will be available afterwards for viewing on TAP's website, www.tapcreativity.org. This month, Poetry London's two feature poets are Roxana Bennett and Greg Santos. They will be introduced by Dominic Parisienne and Roy Geiger, respectively. We are also very pleased to welcome our September local opener poet. Courtney Ward Zvitnoff is Western University's student writer in residence and the editor in chief of Western's Art and Humanities student publication. She is finishing her Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing and English and has a special interest in writing about mental health. Hi, my name is Courtney and I'm Western University student writer in residence. I'm so grateful to be able to open this reading because I've been attending Poetry London's events since I was in my first year at Western and now I'm entering my fifth. So it's an incredible opportunity to be able to share my work. I write primarily creative nonfiction and poetry and since this is Poetry London, I'll be sharing a few poems. The first is a very, very short piece that I wrote earlier this summer in quarantine when time really became quite meaningless and it's called Stasis. I've stopped counting days passing in slow fire. I made kindling of hours and watched it burn unperturbed. Time's a semantic satiation, repeated until it's lost meaning. The next poem I'll read was written for Reside Magazine, which is a lit mag based out of Manchester, for their recent issue called Connections. And there was a constraint involved where every submitter received two words, one to be included in the first line of the poem and one at the end. I was given the words dawn and nightmare. The poem is called Body Gap and somewhat ironically in an issue themed Connections is about disconnection. Median of day, dawn's soft blue eases the room into a bath of 5 a.m. light, slinking between blinds to crosshatch our skin. I could count your lashes, the sleep collecting in your tear ducts, measure the distance of your fallen lids, parted lips, could wonder if there's space to settle in. You've always run cold, but my legs rustled free from the fleece duvet sometime in sleep. You're facing the wall, coiled like a film roll. I could try to define this median of sheets, but the room is stale with sleep as dawn diffuses light like the end of a tight embrace. I close my eyes and decline, aching the slip of a nightmare. So the last poem I'll share with you, I wrote during London's Words Fest last November for their festival zine. It's an ekphrastic poem of an installation by Ron Benner outside Museum London. It features plants that grow along the meridian from the location I'm currently at, the land of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Ottawandaran peoples, and then stretching towards South America. The poem is titled the same name as the installation, As the Crow Flies. As the crow flies down this meridian on this day of November, Spatterdock floats on fresh water, raveled veins of roots drifting under the surface. Milkweed seed pods splinter, erupting white tufts like truffle trees. Echinacea discs are stripped to the spine, bodies crested with thick quills. Hollow sunflower heads slump with pockmarked faces, petals long fallen. 
Tobacco plants finish their flower, pink tips curling from colder weather. Amaranth leans, heavy with seed. Grain drops from crimson stalks along the meridian as the crow flies. Hello, Roy Geiger here for Poetry London to welcome Greg Santos to our series. Greg's from Montreal. He's editor-in-chief of the journal Carte Blanche, and his work in poetry includes the books The Emperor's Sofa, Rabbit Punch, and uh, a book about to appear, Ghostface, all three from DC books. Now, the cover of Rabbit Punch seems to really illustrate the book's tone and style. After all, a rabbit punch, a punch to the base of the skull, is dangerous to say the least. But when we look at this cover, who'd be surprised to find inside lots of pop culture mixed with literary stuff? Where else, for instance, are we going to find Elliot and Yates at Hooters? The book's a punchy, in the moment mix of playfulness, absurdity, insult, dread, rationalization, realization, what we might find when the poet, in Greg's words, rings, that's rings with a W, rings the brain. Greg Santos's heritage is Cambodian, Portuguese, and Spanish, which I mentioned because his new book, Ghostface, explores family ties and heritage. Though still described on the cover as punchy poetry, Ghostface is perhaps more reflective. There's often a gentle sensibility here, working with uncanny aspects of memory and the effort to tease out apprehensions of a heritage never really experienced. So, though I don't know what work he'll be reading, I'm looking forward to watching and listening to Greg Santos ring our brains. Hi, I'm Greg Santos, and I am coming to you all the way from where the Mohawk people call Jojage, uh, also known as Montreal. Uh, I want to say a nice big thank you to Poetry London for the opportunity to share poetry with you all um, in a virtual way, even though we cannot be in person uh, with one another. Uh, so today I'll be reading from two uh, books of mine from my 2014 poetry collection, Rabbit Punch, with DC Books, and also uh, Ghostface with DC Books. Uh, at the time of this recording, the book is not out yet. Uh, I'm hoping that when you all see this, it will be available, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. To begin, this poem is called Our Seafaring Ways. There is an ocean waiting to be swum. If you wish to swim it, hold my hand. We will struggle through the portending fog, portending a magnificent storm. Picture yourself bobbing amidst foam and froth. Zoom out farther. What do you see? Spider webs labyrinths, constellations. In the New Republic of Poetry, after Martin Espada, poets scrawl their verses onto knives, flinging cutlery into the air, letting chance decide. And gypsies slink through throngs, slipping scrolls of poems into oblivious purses and pockets, and the hungry can slip into a bordello and be fed poems until ink drips down their chins. We have returned to this good land, where the forest at twilight is filled with the mingling cries of wolves and flying songbirds. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, um, this book came out in 2014, and uh, some of the poems um, from my very first poetry collection uh, called The Emperor's Sofa uh, took place in a somewhat post-apocalyptic land with an emperor 
whose empire was crumbling, um, and it had taken place after uh, some kind of disaster of some kind. Um, so what's interesting to me is this poem um, takes on a whole new residence, uh, resonance <laughs> during this um, pandemic. The Cave. She slowly opened her eyes, observing the ash swirl under the moonlight. She reaches behind her head, unclips her mask, and breathes very slowly. He is asleep, his frame rising and falling as he breathes. At least we're breathing, she thinks. And here's another one that also takes on new resonance um, in 2020. Presidential Address. The president was on TV and told us all to keep calm. Nothing's going on. See, my wife said, I like the president. He's not freaking out like the rest of us. I turned to my wife. That man is not the president, I said knowingly. Zombies. Zombies like listening to the cranberries, particularly their hit song, Zombie. Zombies like the song because they can relate to it. They nod their heads, mouth agape, ah, they grunt affirmatively. Zombies, however, do not like Rob Zombie. He is not an authentic zombie. He is a live human who has appropriated the zombie name. There is no greater zombie taboo. Look out, Rob Zombie. Behind you! Just kidding. Or am I? Hooray. Yes, the world will not have ended in 2012, as the Mayans predicted, but sadly nor will hoverboards be on vogue. The sun will continue to die. Magnificent tiny creatures with feelers and luminescent bodies we've never even discovered will have gone extinct under our noses. But on the plus side, things will be sleeker, shinier, smaller, and more expensive. This next poem is called the We the Wild Bunch, and I wrote it after hearing uh, John Ashbery, the late great American poet, uh, do a poem where every line um, is taken from a title of a movie. So, we, the wild bunch. We knock around guys. We shut up and sing. We big fish, we take the lead. We hustle and flow, we bring it on. We compañeros, we walking tall. We kids in America. We American outlaws. We bomb the system. We starship troopers. We strangers with candy. We far from heaven, we curious, George. We wordplay. We pulp fiction, we stranger than fiction. We analyze this, we get smart. We in the realms of the unreal, we reign over me, we duel in the sun, we get rich or die trying. We walk the line, we crash, we war dance. We ask the dust. We broken flowers. We secondhand lions. We city of ghosts. We touching the void. So this next part of my reading 
will feature poems from my forthcoming book, Ghostface. Now, Ghostface is different from Rabbit Punch in many ways uh, because I write uh, directly about uh, my background as a transracial adoptee. And that means that my birth family is from a different uh, race than my adopted family. Uh, so I have um, ancestry from Cambodia, and uh, I was raised by a Spanish and Portuguese family, which is where Santos comes from. And so <clears throat> some of my writing has evolved from uh, my previous collections, and I started exploring some of my family history and, um, and mythology uh, in uh, my 2018 collection, Blackbirds. And so uh, Ghostface is me diving deep into um, lots of musings and thoughts and ideas that I don't think I felt ready for um, earlier on in my career. So I'm going to start with the poem, Simri Cambodia. Before stepping into a taxi, a young girl struggles to take the city with her. Warm, sticky air bathing the street market, comforting scent of fragrant rice, pungent odor of dry fish, raw flesh hung on butcher's hooks. Squawking of chickens in rusty wire prisons, crescendo of rickshaws, scooters, bicycles, the city she will no longer call home. As she speeds away, the city recedes into memory, as does the rolling countryside, once dotted by women tending to the patties, children splashing among water buffalo. Now, Echoes of distant missiles pierce her memories. Murders of crows dive into reddened fields. The faces of Angkor watch sadly as their city crumbles, as another one of their children flees, taking nothing with her but me, gently growing inside. So uh, that poem, uh, touches on my imagining my birth mother fleeing uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, in Cambodia. And uh, I was adopted as an infant. And so much of my life has been, you know, uh, mulling over this part of my, my background and uh, history, along with uh, the loving family that raised me. So what's interesting about the title of Ghostface is that, um, well, this book is filled with ghosts. Um, so I'm going to read um, the next poem called Dear Ghosts. One cold, rainy spring evening, as I was drifting off to sleep, M showed me a passage from a new book. Here, a part about the universe, Adams. Atoms, such a beautiful word, like cellar door and hope. Read this, you might want it for your book. In it I read how when things die, their atoms don't disappear or cease to exist, but are redistributed. An ancient fern becomes coal. This lump of coal begets a diamond, and on and on, until the atoms of the fern are nothing but a speck in the web of my hand. Your faces flash in the attic of my memory. You are welcome, spirits. I toss off the covers, rush to my office. I am struggling to capture this moment. How do I grasp onto these silvery apparitions? The moment is gone and I am left gasping, grasping for something to hold. The distant sound of our dishwasher, some light rain outside, and it's gone, 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 redistributed away. Dear ghosts, where do you reside? 
father, tata, nano, vovo, chico, my grandparents, the birth family I never knew. I like to think that you still inhabit our planet. We contain multitudes, right? The galaxy and the speck of a birthmark, the one that I call my chocolate spot, my chocolatito plus, that cannot be smudged off. A planet, a galaxy, the cosmos, heaven, in the palm of my hand, the size of a mustard seed, head of a needle, where angels reside. Within the memory palace, after James Tate. You remember taking your first bite of caribou, hanging from the side of a reservoir, somehow losing your glasses and shoes in the same night, being deathly afraid of helicopters, running, running for your life and never looking back. You had a happy childhood. Then, you awoke in a strange town. You were at a party off in some corner, alone. And someone kissed you in the dark. You stopped running and learned to appreciate strolls through marshes and sand dunes. You even had a chance to sit on a wicker chair for a spell. But the running of your youth was replaced by train tracks watching the horizon rise and fall while at sea, flying over cliffs and dazzling cities, an exquisite afternoon tea service, getting caught in a rainstorm in church, a honeymoon in Rhode Island, push, 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 you're doing great. Childhood. Taking Polaroid pictures of my Transformers. Dancing to Michael Jackson's Smooth Criminal before my parents' mirror. Pretending the pool-cleaning robot was a sea monster. Wrestling with Tata, my grandmother, breaking her glasses. Making my pet rock its cloth bed, tightening its leash. My goldfish, Tom and Jerry. My hermit crabs, Big Bertha, Hermie. My dwarf hamsters, Nutmeg. Tiger and Lucky. My sea monkeys. Sharky, Finn, Minnie, Mickey, George, Tiny Tim, Mo, Cutie Pie, Cuddles, Flip, Sprinkle, Joy, Micro Machine, Bumblebee, Marco, Polo, Chocolate Chip. At the barber, hiding Playboy in The Economist my terror of clowns, my parents paying my birthday clown to leave, book gift from my parents, why was I adopted, my long-standing belief in ghosts. Okay. Scary stories to tell in the dark. Do not enter gingerbread houses, no matter how enticing the icing. Do not take candy from the children of strangers. Saying Bloody Mary three times facing a mirror in the dark is a no-no. Whatever you do, don't leave your foot hanging over the bed overnight. Skulking through the woods and the wind whispers your name, oh boy. That's the Wendigo, my child. In Cambodia, they are taught to fear the Alp, also known as Krasu in Thailand. These apparitions are usually women, their faces young and beautiful. If you were to look down, they are bodiless. The Alp is but a floating head, their spine, guts, icky entrails are all that's left dangling in midair. See their hovering glow, and you're a goner. The Khmer people keep a spirit house near their homes. These stilted wooden structures lead ghosts like apps away from the living, burn some fake money to keep them feeling wealthy, 
Leave a snack for them to, to nosh on. Sticky rice, fruits, coconuts. Donuts are a good bet. Since ghosts have sweet tooths, duh. Sport a red bracelet or tie a red string around your wrist. Doing so will keep your soul from being whisked away from your body. The string reminds you to practice compassion and kindness. Red is the color of good luck and bravery. They say red makes people hungry, too. It's also my son's favorite color, so there's that. You know what they say? Happy ghosts don't bother the living. Therefore, keep a whoopee cushion, joy buzzer, and a joke book on your person at all times. Cross your fingers, knock on wood, super glue a penny to your hand. Heck, toss your old wardrobe at the window. Wear red from head to toe just to be safe. See? Good luck will follow you, skipping down the sidewalk, her hair braids bobbing with every leap, to the ends of time, or maybe even longer. And uh, I'm going to end with uh, maybe one more poem from Ghostface. Uh, Invisible Guests. Alone in our apartment, I notice how quiet it really is without you. The creak of my chair, the clicks as I type, my breathing, the hum of the fridge. Sounds I took for granted amplified by your absence. Tapping from within the walls, mice perhaps, dull breathing of heating vents, the apartment filling with invisible guests. I put on Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald, phantom voices, to keep me company. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you all listening to me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the poetry. Uh, uh, so I uh, hope Ghostface is out by the time that this comes uh, out and you're all able to see this. And thank you again to Poetry Lending for this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my poetry with you all. Uh, take care, uh, be safe. Roxana Bennett's poetry is a gift. I first encountered her work when we read together at an Abel Hamilton Poetry Collective event in 2018. Roxana read from her chapbook, Unseen Garden. Pain is a singularly lonely experience, yet in her poems, I and many others in attendance found the gift of solidarity. So sorry you understand this, she writes. A chair broke during the event, and I will forever be convinced it broke from the weight and power of Roxana's poetry. Roxana could be called a poet of breaking and binding. Her masterful second collection, Unmeaningable, showcases a crown of broken sonnets. These crippled sonnets, as she's called them, exemplify the many ways in which she both engages with and resists expectations. Her writing explores the breaks and complicated ties between bodies, families, structures, and language. It is work that is precise, beautiful, sometimes violent, and often violently beautiful in its precision. Roxana names experience so often unspoken. Last year, I collapsed after a particularly painful treatment at the hospital. In the emergency room, I started to read from her poem, Language of Hospital, from Unmeaningable, to a kind nurse who was curious about the book I had with me. The opening lines. Stories like cathedrals I cradle. I carry my religion in ribcage from waiting room to waiting room. The nurse leaned over, read on, took a picture said she would buy the book for her sister, who has pain and loves poetry. 
said she would read it first, that she felt she should. A gift. Like that nurse, I hope this is your first encounter with Roxana's poetry. Roxana has a keen interest in metamorphosis, in change. And, in my humble opinion, her work has the potential to change you. The trick. Let me be a poet of cripples, not a patient etherized upon a table, not a brain floating within a body. In a moment, I must be a body in the place incision produces in a body previously intact. Inert, poor body, inarticulate. Pain flees from the word pain. Between meaning and the unmeaningable is the trick of thinking I can fix what I can name. Inertia insists on comfortable, contraries less on chastened patience. Let me be any other word, any other body, stone, swan, sycamore. Perform patience full time. Retirement, a normate luxury, I will not be afforded. My need to mean, alien to the pain, yet I remain unseen. Waiting list for Tara Michelle Zinyuk. No, this body can't leave. I am sorry. Anybody understands the spectrum of failing the spectacle. I am sorry for invasive intakes, speculums, slip discs, staircases, September. I am sorry for landlords losing my shit while I'm reading a poem in the middle of it and crying continually. I can feel Shane Nielsen gagging in his throat. I am sorry for landlords, lost bus passes, side effects, editors, icebergs. Remember, being a person or performing what passes. What passes is self's need to be fixed or named. Names for states of loss, for mothering, like mourning being missed. Is it better to be patient, want less? If I leave, I lean towards losing. Can't stand losing. What would I be losing if I left? I hate microphones and cameras and I'm having a panic attack and I'm just going to try to read through it. So please, um, I'm begging your patience. Waiting room. What would I be losing if I left? But the next invasive intake, the next skeptical examiner, the next cut that leaves another scar, the next bargaining for the next ineffective anodyne, the next vain elective abscission, the next insurance claim, the next question that causes shame, the next cursory callous checklist, the next remote rejection, the next hour spent enduring, the next cyst rupturing, the next test, the next test, the next stranger's failure to explain. Reason, reason, is my middle name. My Toad Oracle. Reason. Reason is my middle name between rocks and a bent neck caught on a cracked rib cage. Reason is pain that flees the word pain. Pain we allot to reason without which Unnamed, I am left unfixed. Resistance is futile, like stones, swans, sycamores. Shame, a fixture, 
like churches that specialize in gold. Gold chokes the river. Gold guards the white tower. Gold strangles the garden. We buried you in, O oh heart. The wards are wearing off. The warden wandered off, O oh heart. Caught in my chemicals chimerical. My toad oracle, invisible. Do you need to check this in more to me? Is this the key? Oh, it's a pretty baby! It's a big baby! It's a big baby! It's a big baby! His beak isn't still fully open. So he can't crack okay. them open yet on his own. It's a big baby! Hi baby! Oh, there's a bullet. You got an object. That's a peanut. Okay, not toast. Empirical evidence. Oh, heart, caught in my chemicals, chimerical. Invisible, empirical. Evidence of closets our mother hid us in. No wire hangers. No wire hangers. Sin. Sin. Sing another label shift on the spectrum when a new SSRI hits the market. Who loses the game of side effect or symptom? Who gets to be human? Who, who, who sings, oh heart? Who, who, who? My name, oh heart, please leave evidence of your passing. I am heart sick of passing, of being passed over, anchored to a past sinning, evidence of which mass, molecular, mitochondrial, diamonds, in dendrites, and anchors, and ashes. Happy to be here. Language of hospital. Stories like cathedrals I cradle. I carry my religion in ribcage from waiting room to waiting room, being here at all a radical act. Great symptoms of violet from one to ten. Name victims of violence from birth to death. Think kingdoms want women? Think again. Nurses needle, nag with stifling kindness. Incurious surgeons treat patients like plague as those stories are contagious. My father spoke the language of stone, swan, sycamore, stuck in the throat. Aphasia. My father sticks in my throat, a black clot. I won't swallow a stone, swan, sycamore. My father is a story I am stuck in to rot, a weather-worn red boat on a rough river. My father stones the moat with lapis lazuli, drowns my medicine Buddha in Red River. My father is a serpent unsorry, whose x-rays reject the messenger. My father is root cellar, rabbit hole, I can't climb out of, a ladder, lectern, light. My father stars the spectacle, charcoal sketches of burnt down forests, graphite lines of departure, inks atlases of sunk gushers, lost daughters, ophiolite, unloved. The omniscient physician who removes every pain. Lost daughter, ophiolite unloved, under island, Red egg caught in the throat of a dead dog. Mad hag coughing up blood maiden molts when she sins. Serpentine's ghost haunts the mountain, the mountain, the mountain you're buried under, father. The ashes lie. Auger my anger in my entrails and what organs are left after Porta Bass. All fathers say, oh darlings, open up. 
your legs and swallow stone swan sycamore another word for slaughter red daughter dangle a skin rabbit limp purpling primal locked in fossil limbs rigid ancient no god could have saved them Typhoid and swans. Hannibal, let's hunt white coats, those ants in the afterbirth. Birth to scapegoat to burn while they murder us earth. Hannibal, they owe me awe but recognize nothing. Ghost gods' chirurgical urge to purge left us cold, pulped under rubble. Hannibal, set the table. Another white coat's fable of physic failed the devil's amulet. Hannibal, disrupt liturgy of the able who deny all bodies need care carry my bloody body unrooted from world tree the hermit holds up her lantern body unrooted from world tree in the ring of seven small stars reversed red boat on a rough sea the devil's alchemist, red swan, rising, rising, rising. This is not a time for sensuality. Descend the evolutionary ladder. The rock is old, pitted. This is not consent. We do not see flowers, grass, trees, only rock. Holes in the rock merge with holes in the women's dress. Sea, suns, sicken. No beasts appear. Churches collapse. This is not fixed. To clean the wound, reach back into childhood. Some deep pain. The moon. Empress of Cups. The moon mothers my body. Mothering ate the maid in me. My mother regrets are serpentine. My mother wounding seen to mean envy once sweet sabret settles in sediment. Snap a glass spine, red mother, teacup shatters. Material is the devil's illusion. Ours is time to unlearn sanism's purgatorial spectacle. But is it lyrical to loose a cannibal in the children's hospital? Red mother, dead brother, the belt is the noose. In a clean suit and clown nose, Hannibal enthralls chemo kids, orphaned by clock wars. Orphans shed anchors and mothers on the far shore. Pan's Labyrinth. Orphans shed anchors on the far shore, searching inland for the great god Pan, whom they renamed Panic, who was bored to the tower, the clock, the bagman. They fed me clonazepam, so I would not dream you. When I laughed, they called me Manic. Carry my bloody body. This is not consent. Tongueless, nameless, still hungry, under the black mountain, the black mountain collapses. Heron's oval lodged in my throat. Look for me in your labyrinth, great pan. Violet hyacinth transplanted by white coats to the underworld. Gold migrated from altar ruins. You will not sleep among them. Last one. I think I'm gonna read a long one to do a captive audience, and then I can feel like um, you, put, you know, you got your phone stores. You're sitting through my panic attack. Um, 
Or now you're like, oh, it's a long one. I just turn it off now and leave like that. Oh, the last of the iron lungs. Thank you, thank you for listening. Let me, yeah, let me check it again. The last of the iron lungs. I'm also sure I'm totally mispronouncing this name, Hephaestus, who got kicked out of Olympus for being deformed. Um, he had a club foot. So he was not good enough to live with the gods, but he was totally good enough to labor for them and make all their weapons and armor. So, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not saying the name correctly. But. The last of the iron lungs. Hephaestus fell far for a fucked foot. What hope could a whole body have? What hope? Hephaestus, hide me in a hammered hide. I cannot suffer this dependence. I hid the limits my body-mind placed upon my daily life until prayer wheels flicker outside the window. I am able, sometimes, to see I is not sight. I am able, sometimes, to walk the boundary of acceptable if I can mask the pain, display my cane, make comfortable the able. There is no choice but to live in this moment and this, breath by breath, what choice? Am I breathing or being breathed? Am I what air enters, what abandons, what returns? Hephaestus, the last of the iron lungs recycled for cola cans, and the plaster shadow my grandmother cast upon her children fades. She performed the rituals of daily life with a steel rod to brace her spine. Her children stomped on sidewalk cracks and felt a frisson of filthy guilt. What choice, Hephaestus? What choice? I scaled my grandfather's ladder, but froze halfway, pinned in place by sudden certainty that something sinister awaited me. Hephaestus, I was raised to lower my eyes in the face of authority. I was raised in a place that favored sons and sons and sons of sons, spent summers dredging the river for stolen gold. An old man's face watched the place where his children poisoned the water, glitters, hides what lies beneath the waters, Leviathan. Open up your holes and swallow. Sunk cities, secrets, and the bodies. Oh, the bodies, the bodies clog. The rivers, filthy rivers, bodies poisoned by alleged resin and runoff they claim did not cause. The subtler mutations, sins in the system, forests fall into wastewater, and what air, who could breathe? I used to pray, did I pray? Who could say what God? Saturn, heavily ringed? Venus burning, brightly, slightly blue, the color of medicine, pigmentless eyes, old meat. Hephaestus, I am afraid of the rage and the monster passing has made of me, not the misery of the body-mind, but the dismissal of my agency. I only ever dreamed of being able to author my own narrative not of being the subject of a thousand horror stories. Inspiration is a monster, the director claims, displaying his collection of artifictions of fake and facts, and for the finale, full-sized freaks arranged by order of deformity, a funhouse mirror for the able, but a reflection for me with my cane, her with her walker, me with my pain, her with her cancer. We watch the watchers, I is not sight. Look at the fat lady, sing fat lady, sing. Look, look at that fat lady, look at that dog-faced girl. Look at, look at that, God, what a waste. Put a bag on her head and, do I inspire? I question the marks the audience leaves upon the subject made object of difference. What inspires the audience to reject the rejected, to project their own shadows on the museum walls? Who protects the monsters? 
from the nightmare of the audience. Hephaestus, I am able to withstand, not being able to stand, but the questions, the questions, the questions, each examination a flashback to the witness stand. My narrative seems credible, but not provable. The face to howl to salvage autonomy from the wreckage they have left of me. The face to, it's monstrous. What they do, what they say, what they called me when they could not find a reason, reason to fit their criterion. The face to, what authority allows this violation this drift into isolation. Thank you. Thank you to Courtney Wards Beatnoff, Roxana Bennett, and Greg Santos for sharing their excellent poetry, and thanks to our audience for watching. A reminder that Roxana's book, Unmeaningable, published by Gordon Hill Press, and Greg's book, Ghostface, published by DC Books, are available for purchase through the links in the video description below. Please join us again on Wednesday, October 21st at 7 p.m. for our next event, which will feature poets Ali Blythe and Randy Lundy.